Scripture for the message is Luke 8, verses 40 through 56. Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. There came a man named Jairus, who was the ruler of a synagogue. Falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. When Jesus went, the people pressed around him. There was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling, and falling down before him, she declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now while he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and he said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when he came uh, to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter, John, and James, and the father and mother of the child. All were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned. She got up at once. He directed that something should be given to her to eat. And her parents were amazed. But he charged them to tell no one what had happened. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame, then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. Many of us, as this songwriter, have been longing to be touched by the hand of Jesus. Unfortunately, sometimes, at least in that longing, we focus on ourselves, and we focus on some particular problem we have at the moment, and then maybe even we wonder, where is Jesus in our time of need when that trial doesn't seem to end very quickly? Instead of that attitude, we're called to focus upon Jesus, his faithfulness, his trustworthiness. And then over time, and only over time, will we see whether this trial is something we're called to endure for a long period of time, maybe the rest of our life here on earth, or whether Jesus will indeed give a sign by some kind of healing now that points to a greater healing that he's already actually doing. In either case, our trust is in Jesus. Not that our problem or trial is going to end now. We don't know that. Only Jesus can. But we can trust that he's always there and he's always touching us in this deeper way. Even if we don't see results of you know, things that we can see here and now. That's what our text, I think, lifts up for us as we get an account of two healing signs that Jesus did. He's returned from the Gentile side of the Sea of Galilee now back to the Jewish side, and we're told that the crowds were already expecting him and gathered there. He meets a man named Jairus who asks him to come to his house because his 12-year-old daughter is dying, and Jesus says he will go. Well, on the way, crowds are pressing in on him. He encounters another woman. She's been bleeding for 12 years, and the bleeding hasn't stopped. Now, in Israel, in that day and age, bleeding uh, caused someone to be considered unclean. 
So the fact that she couldn't stop bleeding meant that she was, in a sense, ostracized for 12 years. She wasn't supposed to touch anyone else. She wasn't supposed to be around them, to be in close contact. She wasn't able to worship for 12 years. She did see doctors or physicians and yet and spent all her money doing that, but she was never cured. And yet now she hears about Jesus and something about who he is makes a difference in her heart. And so she goes up behind him in the crowd and she touches the fringe of his garment and instantly she is made well. Well, Jesus doesn't want what happened to be a secret. And so he stops everybody and he won't let them continue until she comes forward and tells her story. And then he says, daughter, your faith has saved you, has made you well. Go in peace. Now notice that her belief and trust were in Jesus. Um, him being who he is and what that means for her and everybody. It wasn't in her being healed. She doesn't know for sure she could be healed, but she knows he can heal her. And he does heal her as a sign of a greater healing that he brings to all of us, uh, healing from sin. Now while that has occurred, messengers from Jairus' house come and say his daughter has died, don't bother the teacher anymore. But Jesus responds to Jairus, fear not, only believe, and she will be made well, or she will be saved. Now again, notice that's two different things. Believe, and she will be made well. The believing was in Jesus, just in who he is. Not, he wasn't believing that she would be made well. She, she, the Jairus simply believed in Jesus, and then Jesus gave him the promise, your daughter will be made well. So she trusts, or he trusts Jesus and his promise. He's not trusting simply that he uh, can somehow, by believing it enough, that uh, his daughter will be raised. When they get to the house, though, the funeral has already started. And people just don't believe that this can happen, but Jesus literally says, grasp the girl's hand and says, child, arise. And she arose immediately. This is a sign, once again, of a greater healing when Jesus raises all of us to a sinless, resurrected life. That's something he's always doing. Sometimes he gives signs of that, like here, where the daughter literally is resuscitated back to this life, uh, here and now. For both Jairus and the woman, their focus was on Jesus, not on themselves and their needs as pressing as those needs were. Jesus being who he is inspires faith and trust. And here signs were indeed granted here and now. Today we're still called to focus on Jesus. He may grant signs even now, but he's always touching us. Even if our problem or trial doesn't go away here and now, that doesn't mean that Jesus hasn't touched us. His touch is bringing about an eternal healing, an eternal wholeness. And because of that, in fact, sometimes if the trial does remain, if it doesn't go away instantly, that may be a better witness to the world around us. If they just see, for example, we have an illness and we get healed from it instantly, they may want to have that happen in their lives too, to have their problems go away instantly, but they're not necessarily believing and hearing anything about Jesus. If they see our attitude with a trial that stays and remains, then the fact that those problems or trials don't conquer us in our hearts, then they can see how Jesus, through his suffering and his trials, brought about an eternal salvation for all, for all of us by how we are responding in our attitude. We become instruments of Jesus' suffering, which can show a greater sign. But either way, with either case, 
it's still a sign that Jesus brings. And we should focus on him and let him either give the immediate sign or not give that sign according to his wisdom. Chosen example, excuse me, <coughs> by a woman named Marilyn Ludolph, especially because she really struggles with this idea. She wanted something to happen here and now in her life, and she's struggling to even understand what faith and trust are, and maybe that uh, resonates with us a little more. She was tempted to be consumed by her trials, and that was understandable. Her, uh, Marilyn said, for 12 long, unbearable years, she had suffered from tormenting headaches and a severe facial rash, where she had bumps all over and then larger sores, and her face was always fiery red. Now, this didn't keep her from having a life. She was married, had two teenage sons, she was a third grade teacher, but her trial made her life a struggle, even to get up in the morning. She said she tried everything, special diets, uh, oatmeal soap, baby oil, vitamins, enough creams and ointments to fill a small drugstore, she said. There was a long line of doctors that had passed by in her life, leaving her with little hope. And with all of this, the rash had gotten worse. She said her face would swell and itch and turn tomato red at the very slightest stimulus. She took eight pills a day for pain uh, because of the rash and because of the headaches. Marilyn was in danger of what she said of being consumed by despair. Her so-called prayers at the time were either just pleas for her trial to just go away or worse yet, complaints. She remembered one time just crying out, Oh God, why don't you help me? As if God didn't care about it. One day, a co-worker suggested a particular dermatologist that she had never heard of, and so she thought, why not? I'll try somebody else. So, had a long series of allergy tests, and he came back and he said, you know, maybe we've got an answer here. It appears that you're allergic to yourself. Her first thought was, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and he's like, no, really, you've... You have our bodies produce certain bacteria, and yours seems to be allergic to your own bacteria. And it's like, well, what in the world can I do about that? Well, we'll make a special serum out of your own saliva, and I'll teach you how to inject yourself uh, every day. So every day for three years, she took these injections. And maybe a little less red in her face, maybe the headaches a little less severe, and yet still uh, didn't really heal it. So three years later, uh, later, another doctor was suggested and said, well, you're allergic to many foods. And he gave her a diet, peas, potatoes, carrots, lettuce, and lean meats. And that was it. Couldn't eat anything else, no breads, anything else. Her weight dropped to 102 pounds. You're wasting away, Mom, her son said one day. And she knew she couldn't keep on this diet. Now, during all this time, Marilyn was still teaching a Sunday school class. And one Sunday, she found herself telling her class that God is the answer. And when immediately those words came out of her mouth, it kind of triggered something in her mind, and those words stayed with her. And when she got home that Sunday from church, they just kept coming back to her, God is the answer. And she would tell herself that I tell this to others, but what am I doing myself? She said she could feel like that woman in our text that had been uh, bleeding for 12 years and had spent all her money on doctors. And yet Jesus healed that woman, she thought. And yet where she was at at the time, she said she didn't even know if healings could even happen today. Now notice she's still focusing on herself and her issues, whether or not she can be healed. And so one night on TV, it struck her when she heard a woman describing her life and saying that God had healed her. And she thought, it is possible then that we can actually have healings uh, in this day and age. 
The woman had said something about God had done the healing, but she had prepared herself to be healed. So Marilyn thought, that's what I have to do. I've got to prepare myself to be healed, to exercise my faith muscles. Her Bible had a little concordance in the back, so she, she opened it up and she went through her Bible and she wrote down 36 scripture verses that had to do with either healing or, uh, or faith. Now notice she was still focusing on herself and her condition and whether this could all help her. But I think God graciously used those scriptures to help her start to focus upon him. For example, one of the verses was Psalm 103 where it says, Let all that I am praise the Lord. He forgives all my sins. He heals all my diseases. Now at the time, she was focusing on he heals all my diseases. But to me, the overall, the verse is saying, let all that I am praise the Lord. The Lord is so wonderful and grateful. And because he is so wonderful, there's all these benefits that overflow to us, including forgiveness of sins and healing of diseases. Or another one of those 36 verses was Jeremiah 17. Oh Lord, if you heal me, I will be truly healed. And again, at first, I think she was just hearing, I will be truly healed. But as Jeremiah is saying, that if you, Lord, heal me, because you are who you are, then I'll be truly healed, not just, not just some healing in the world's eyes. So I think as Marilyn uh, went about and every day uh, started reciting all 36 of these verses that she had written down over and over again. So she said the pages were all worn where she had written them down. I think Jesus started shifting the focus through those verses upon his own goodness instead of her trial. Slowly she kept hearing as she recited these verses that God is faithful. God is trustworthy. God is good in all that he does. It's not that he's neglecting her or abandoning her in some kind of way. Eventually, in her particular case, she did receive a sign here and now. Her headaches went away as well as her rash. God and faith had made me whole, she said. But to me, that was just a sign of a greater wholeness that Jesus was already bringing to her and brings to us all. So here God granted a sign to someone who maybe didn't even understand after the sign was done of fully what that sign was saying and what it meant. That Jesus is always touching us and he's touching us to bring about an eternal healing. And so in our trials, we too may or may not receive a sign, but Jesus is still always touching us. He's not neglecting us. He didn't go away somewhere. He's always working. He's always answering. He's always doing what's best for us. He's faithful. <laughs> we can trust in him. So may we not focus on our trials, but on the one Jesus who brings us eternal 